secured a $4.3 million Templeton grant, the largest of its kind in university's history, to fund a large-scale interdisciplinary project studying the nature of understanding. He comes to us tonight to talk about the nature of wisdom. Please welcome Professor Stephen Grimm. So thank you to, uh, to you all for coming. Thank you to my friend Bill Jaworski for the invitation. Um, and uh, like, as Bill said, I'm very grateful to uh, the Waltons for sponsoring this lecture series. I believe I've been to uh, all four of the Walton lecture series that have been hosted in this room. And they've all been great events, interesting speakers, fascinating topics. So I'm hoping some of those good vibes channel over to tonight. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, the nature of the topic, nature of wisdom, and then uh, how I became interested in this topic. So with respect to the topic wisdom, you would think that because philosophy is the love of wisdom, that philosophers talk about wisdom all the time, that it's one of our preoccupations or maybe even one of our obsessions. But that's not actually true. When I was going through uh, undergrad and up through grad school, occasionally the topic of wisdom would come up, but quite rarely. Sometimes maybe when we were discussing Aristotle's ethics, you talk about wisdom. But on the whole, it wasn't really in the picture. So philosophers did talk about interesting stuff. We talk a lot about, about the nature of justice and beauty and knowledge good things, but wisdom, for whatever reason, has dropped out of the picture. So one thing I'd like to do in this talk is give kind of, well, I'm curious about why it dropped out of the picture. I have a bit of an explanation for why it's not as much in the forefront. So it has something to do with, I think, the nature of philosophy as it's practiced now, some of our presuppositions. But I can tell you just as a, on a personal level, uh, also why, so my interest and why I think uh, wisdom isn't featured. So as a philosopher, I came to graduate school, saw that we weren't really talking about wisdom, and thought, isn't this bizarre? Isn't this, isn't this really puzzling? Shouldn't I start writing about wisdom? And so I said, as, as a 27-year-old or so. And I think one of the reasons why I can now appreciate why wisdom isn't the focus is because after I had that first thought, shouldn't I be writing about wisdom, my second thought was, why would I? That's crazy. Wisdom is such an intimidating topic. It's so daunting. And in the back of my head, I thought, surely I would have to be wise in order to write about wisdom. And since I knew, knew I fall, fell short of that, and I suspect since my colleagues in philosophy had a similar kind of humility with respect to the topic, that could be just a personal reason why wisdom isn't really featured in philosophical discussion. But as you can see, I've gotten over it. <laughs> and uh, I think the key to uh, getting over it, to thinking about wisdom clearly, is just to realize that even if you don't consider yourself wise, we all make judgments about wisdom uh, regularly. I think we can all identify people in our lives that we take to be wise and some that we take to be less than wise some even that we might take to be foolish. So what I'm going to do is try to present a, a, a theory of what I think is guiding our judgments. So when we say that, when you think in your own lives, so when you think that some of your friends are, are wise, or your parents, or some of your colleagues, or whatever it might be are wise, what I want to know, what I want to think about, is what it is that's driving these judgments. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background. These are people, when I think, uh, in my own life, who are wise. So, uh, the person on my left is my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, Robert Trainer. So, uh, my grandfather came over, well, I, when I was a kid, I was told that he came over from Ireland. That's not really true. So, uh, his parents came over from Ireland and settled in Manhattan. Uh, they worked, uh, my great-grandfather, I guess, worked as... Um, in the stable of a wealthy person in Manhattan. He took care of the horses of someone in Manhattan. It could have been around here. I've been asking my mom, like, where exactly did this come from? Because it could have been quite close. 
but he was born in Manhattan after his parents had just emigrated in 1892 and married a young woman from Dublin, my grandmother, Elizabeth Casey, shortly thereafter, moved out to New Jersey, raised eight children. My mom was one. And by the time I came on the scene, my grandfather was 81 years old. So you would think he would be reaching senility, but throughout my whole life, I thought my grandfather was just someone who I would have just automatically said was wise. It's hard to say why exactly. My grandmother had died by then, but just the way he treated us, just the kindness with which he treated us. He never raised his voice at us. He always seemed to think about the right things and have the right priorities. So my grandfather, Robert Kennedy, is someone I would regard as wise. The person on the upper right, you probably know, several of you know, is Flannery O'Connor, the great American author, so famous for her short stories and her novels. She was born in Savannah in 1925 and later moved to Milledgeville, Georgia, when she came down with lupus in her mid-twenties. So for the undergrads especially, if you haven't read Flannery O'Connor's short stories, you need to. But really what makes me think of Flannery O'Connor as wise, as one of my real intellectual heroes, is a book of letters that came out posthumously, so after her death, were collected in a book called The Habit of Being. And you read through 300 pages of Flannery O'Connor's letters, and just the wisdom, the insight, the humor, the grace is just pouring off of every page. So sometimes it's difficult to know when you encounter a famous person, is that person really wise, because you don't know a lot about their personal life. But when you come to know Flannery through her letters, I think it's unmistakable that she's wise. So the person on the lower right, I'm sure many of you don't know, that's my wife, Rachel. So I think she's not only really smart and talented, but also very wise, which is really annoying, actually. Because when you're married to someone who's wise, and you just know that when an argument starts, that 90% of the time you're just going to be on the wrong side of it, it's pretty frustrating. But on the whole, it's obviously a good thing. So again, think of people in your own life. Think of people who you regard as wise, and then start thinking, why would I put these people on this list as opposed to not on this list? So we could keep going with this game. I'll just do one slide, and then I'll point out something else. So here are five folks, just famous folks. We could have chosen other famous folks. And again, my guess is that when you look at these people, some of them you take to be wise, and some of them less than wise. And moreover, there's an interesting distinction, too, because I think what these examples help to bring out is I don't doubt that everyone on these slides is extremely smart, really intelligent. But I think what the difference, I think we all intuitively can sense a difference between being smart and being wise. So again, start thinking about what might be behind this difference. So one bit of data, this difference between being smart and being wise, a study came out in 2002 in the Journal of Personality, oh wow, that doesn't look right. And social, let me see if I can get it back. Maybe I can reconstruct it for you. Yeah, I can. So the columns are screwed up, but here's how it's supposed to look. On the left, these were supposed to be paradigms of intelligence. And this was a survey that was given out to 800 students and 250 adults. So students ranging from the University of Berkeley to the University of Georgia to UBC. I'm really wondering whether the next slide is going to come out. But in terms of paradigms of intelligence, the top person was Einstein, then Bill Clinton, Leonardo da Vinci. But the wise list, so if you successfully reconstructed this in your head, so the first person, the most wise person that people recommended was Gandhi and Confucius, Jesus, Martin Luther King Jr., Socrates, Mother Teresa, Solomon, the Buddha, the Pope. 
And I don't know if this slide's going to work. The next slide is supposed to bring this together in a dazzling way, but let's see what happens. <laughs> okay, so the, the, so I just find surveys like this interesting, and again, wondering, what is it about the people on the right-hand side, the wise side, that makes them wise and distinguishes them from some of these intelligence? But another thing I liked about the survey was that one person, and only one person, came up on both lists. So, um, uh, so the number eight in terms of intelligence, and uh, number 10 in terms of wisdom. And if I've already told you this, don't answer. But uh, maybe I could take uh, suggestions from the undergrads or other people. Take a guess. Who might you think? These surveys were done in 1990. Take a guess. Yeah. So here's a hint. Uh, she's still alive. She's still with us. Yeah. <laughs> Oprah. So Oprah's name should pop up. It was a lot cooler when the graph actually worked. <laughs> but anyway, so Oprah pops up as the greatest sage, practically, <laughs> of our generation. She's not only very smart, but very wise. Okay, so we have some instances, some paradigms, I think, of, of people who are wise, and some paradigms of people who are intelligent. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that I think there are um, hard cases. So people who, who, are, who are so intelligent in such a particular way that there's a strong temptation to think of them as wise. Uh, so the person on the left is Machiavelli, who uh, his famous treatise, The Prince, is so full of insight about human psychology that it's tempti very tempting to call Machiavelli wise. Uh, or the picture on the left, so depicting um, uh, the devil as understood in, in traditional Christianity. It's tempting to think of the devil as wise, but if you think of Machiavelli as wise, if you think of the devil as wise, then that doesn't fit so well with all the other people on the wise list. Gandhi, Confucius, Martin Luther King Jr., Jesus, who seem to be, uh, seem to be characterized by their moral goodness not just by their intelligence. So some of these judgments aren't so clear. I'll return to the case of Machiavelli and, um, and the devil towards the end of the talk. Okay, so that was kind of primer. Start thinking about people in your life who you regard as wise and then try to think about what it is that drives that judgment. So now I'll start to introduce my own theory about what I think captures those judgments. Uh, but I think to begin with, first of all, it's very helpful to make a distinction between what we might call domain-specific wisdom, and uh, I'm tempted to call wise overall. So we could call, we do, in fact, often think of people as wise in particular ways. So someone might be a wise mechanic, or a wise baseball manager, or a wise stock analyst, or a wise gardener. But in addition to those domain-specific senses of wisdom, I think, you know, if those judgments earlier were correct, we also think of people as wise in a, in a broader way. So I'm, I'm going to call this overall wisdom or maybe wisdom of a person. So it's no contradiction to say of someone that while he or she might be a wise stockbroker or a wise mechanic, uh, he or she isn't wise overall. So just to focus our attention, I'm trying to think about what it means to be wise overall to try to focus on that judgment, not just wise in a particular domain. And here's uh, going to be my basic claim, that wisdom is constituted by uh, knowledge of how to live well, to put it in slogan form, that the wise person is someone who knows how to live well, and that one person is wiser than another, or you grow in wisdom when you acquire more of this knowledge. So in a way, I think this is kind of a platitude. I mean, it, that's a good thing in philosophy. It sounds compelling. Um, so, but the hard thing, even when something sounds initially compelling, is spelling it out, is trying to put meat on the bones of this account, is articulating it. So that's what I'll be doing over the next uh, few slides. And uh, another challenge, even with a platitude like this, is answering objections. And you might wonder what kind of objections people could have to an account like this, but philosophers have actually thought of some very interesting objections. I'll just give you a preview of one. 
According to some philosophers, um, it's a mistake to say that wisdom requires knowledge of how to live well because knowledge is just too high of an epistemic state. If you know something, the argument goes, uh, the object of the subject, the, what you believe is true, but according to this objection, you can be wise even if your beliefs fall short of truth. You could just be in a bad situation. You could have done the best you could, had highly rational beliefs, but you don't know it because you didn't hit at the truth, but that shouldn't leave you out of the company of the wise, according to this objection. So let's try to spell out uh, the basic idea. So I'm going to say that what it means to uh, know how to live well, that this in fact is constituted by three different types of, you might say, sub-knowledge, or three different uh, sub-components of knowledge. That knowing how to live well is constituted by uh, knowing uh, what's good or important for well-being, uh, knowing where one stands relative to what's good or important for well-being, and um, a, the third component would be knowledge of effective strategies for obtaining or realizing what's good or important for well-being. So what I'm going to argue is that all of those components are that they're, uh, that they're each necessary conditions on wisdom. You might think that, uh, you might be wondering if this is kind of, uh, if you're familiar with so philosophy, there's a, p a field called epistemology. We think a lot about knowledge. So I'm actually an epistemologist. And if you're familiar with uh, the fields, you might think that this is a definition that only an epistemologist could have dreamed up. Because it talks about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge as the essence of wisdom. And you might think that one thing that's being left out is something like a lived out component of wisdom. Because surely the wise person doesn't just know a lot, but as it were, takes up or appropriates or lives out that knowledge in particular ways. So that's one thing I'm going to consider, whether they're not just individually sufficient, uh, necessary conditions, but whether they're jointly uh, sufficient or whether we need to add something to the account. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but let's try to spell out more uh, the first condition, knowledge of what's good or important for well-being. So the way I think of this, this is a really crucial part of the, the account, um, that Someone who knows, so the idea that someone knows uh, what's good or important for well-being, especially what I, how I'd like to think of that is the person who's wise knows uh, what's more or less important for well-being. That is, as, is as it were, that they could, in some sense, rank or uh, compare in the correct way different things that are good or important for well-being. So you might put this in slogan form in other ways, that the wise person understands uh, what's really important for living well, that the wise person understands what's, what really matters. And we could try to illustrate that with um, positive examples, right? We could go back to that list from 2002, and I could just pick out someone like uh, Gandhi or the Buddha, and we could start talking about what that person regarded as, as uh, what's good or important for well-being or what's really important. But by my light, it actually helps to, uh, to think not of someone who's really wise, but of someone who falls short of wisdom, and then to, as it were, reverse engineer and figure out what is it that that person is missing. Uh, so it would be kind of mean to choose a real person and say, this person is falling short. What's that person missing? So it's easier, I think, and I find it more illuminating to think of an example from literature. Actually, these are a couple examples from literature, right? But the image on the left is uh, Tolst from Tolstoy's uh, novella from 1886, uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Now, I don't know how many people in the audience have read uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. Um, okay. So, um, Ivan Ilyich is an aspiring um, lawyer and then judge in Russia. Um, one of the striking things about him, though, is that he spends... Uh, the majority of his life uh, striving for things which at the end of his life he just comes to realize were just completely uh, completely the wrong priorities. So he goes through his life trying to uh, dress in just the right way that he'll impress the bourgeois people in his business 
to get just the right furniture in his house, again, to impress his friends, to fill his life with as many pleasant diversions, card games as possible. These are the important things for Ivan Ilyich. And what's much less, less important are things like having a good relationship with his spouse, his wife, having a good relationship with his children. These things are clearly at the bottom of his list. So if you think that in virtue of having those priorities, as I do, that Ivan Ilyich isn't wise, that in fact he's an emblem of someone who's foolish, my explanation of that, according to the account, is that is, is simply that it's because he has, he has a word, didn't value things in the right way. He valued minor things as if they were the most important oh, things. That person he valued much more important out. things in a much lesser way. And just think, as he did, at, at Ivan Ilyich, at the end of his life, he came to realize, at so the death of Ivan Ilyich, the last pages of the book are, so he comes down with this mysterious condition and just starts to slowly waste away. The last three days of his life, he's just in bed, crying out in agony, screaming, basically. And his wife and his children, who never really loved him or just who felt distance from him, don't know what to do. But they come by his bedside at the end, and they show affection for him. And Ivan Ilyich shows affection back. Um, and he comes to think that, again, his life had just been, he led it in all the wrong ways. And if you think that's a gain in wisdom, it's because he's coming to realize what is more, more important for well-being. Tywin Lannister, so for Game of Thrones fans, uh, he's the ruthless patriarch of the Lannister clan in Game of Thrones. Uh, so, if, so he's a very formidable figure. But he makes it clear that the most valuable thing uh, in his life, and he wants to pass on to his children, is perpetuating and elevating the Lannister name and things like caring for innocent life or caring for his children are much less important. So maybe if you were a Lannister, you would think this is wise. This is, in fact, the priorities people should have. But if you think that he's not wise or if you think that something's gone astray, um, I, suspect, I submit to you that it's because I think he elevated the wrong things. He didn't understand what was truly uh, good or important for well-being. So I just have uh, a few more examples. So I think this idea that wisdom is tied to knowing what's good or important for well-being is also connected to the idea that, well, we think wisdom is importantly tied to experience. We think that as you grow older, you will often become wiser. And it would be nice if we could give some explanation of how age uh, leads to wisdom. And I would suggest, um, I mean, there are many dimensions to this. It's not a necessary relationship, but I think it does often happen. I think what happens as you get older is as you become acquainted, as you experience these different uh, possibilities, you come to realize, um, as it were, their real weight to their real significance. So the example that I have of job loss is I might have thought, you know, suppose at one time in my life I thought that um, losing my job would have been uh, the worst thing that could have happened to me and that I would have been absolutely devastated. But then suppose it happens and I realize that while it's bad, that I can kind of muddle through and I come to think that it would have been much worse if I had lost my integrity or if I had lost my friendships or if I had lost my family. So one thing that experience does is to help you to see, as it were, the true weight of these different uh, alternatives. Or I have the example of a car ride up there. So suppose I'm thinking about, we're, you know, as a family, we're thinking about planning a road trip, and I think, so what are the alternatives? I could save a little money, we could drive, and surely it's not going to be that bad to have three kids in the back of the car for eight hours. <clears throat> But then I go through the thing, and I realize the hell it is. And I realize that, <clears throat> that this is one of the things, it's a serious negative. And that, in fact, giving up a little cash that might be worthwhile overall. So that's what I think one of the things experience does. It helps us to get a bit better sense of the different weight of these, these different alternatives. 
Now, um, this is important too. So notice I've been talking a lot about well-being. What's good or important for well-being and what's more or less important for well-being. Now, um, there are a lot of examples that I think we would agree with in this room, like innocent life, say, is more valuable than different things. Uh, having a good relationship with your family is more valuable than having uh, the right furniture in your apartment. But um, largely, I think one of the reasons why coming up with a theory of wisdom is so difficult is because it does depend importantly on well-being, the notion of well-being. And there's a sense in which I think to give a full or complete account of wisdom, I wouldn't just have to tell you that uh, the wise person knows what's good or important for well-being. That would be stage one, as it were. But stage two, I would then tell you, and here's what is more or less important for well-being. Here's what's, you know, in a general way and in particular cases. Now, just to be for modesty to come in here, I think that that is, in fact, extremely difficult to do. And that arguably to do that stage two and to get in front of you and say, this is more and less important than well for well-being, or to give you some general theory, arguably I would have to be wise. But in a general way, I'm just claiming that our judgments about wisdom track our judgments about well-being. So um, this is kind of a, a modest claim about the theory but I'm simply claiming, so we might make a distinction between a fully articulated theory of wisdom and a partially articulated theory of wisdom. I'm claiming to offer you a partially articulated theory that our judgments about who's wise track our judgments about whether the person knows what's good or important for well-being. I'm not taking the step in, second step in telling you what's good or important for well-being. We're trying to. Uh, some examples come up, which I think we can all agree on, but also I think that's a really hard task. Okay, now even though uh, I'm not going to try to offer you a theory of well-being, I do think that there are some significant that there's some significant points about well-being that we can also agree on in a formal sense. So this is a quote from Jane Goodall. Sorry, it's kind of long. I'll read it to you. So she's a renowned uh, climatologist, uh, conservationist, scientist. And what Jane Goodall claims is that, um, so she says, it's awfully sad that with our clever brains capable of taking us to the moon and developing all these sophisticated ways of communicating around the planet, that we seem to have lost wisdom. And that's the wisdom of indigenous people who would make a major decision based on how that decision would affect people seven generations ahead. We're making decisions now based on the bottom line. How will this affect me now, me and my family now? Uh, how will this huge decision affect the next shareholders meeting three months ahead? How will this decision I make today affect my election campaign? Something like that. So although we think we're caring about our children and grandchildren, we're actually stealing their future. Now what I find insightful about Goodall's quote is that so she, she essentially says, so the way I put it is that the wise person knows what's very important for well-being. For all I've said so far, it could have just been uh, my own well-being, the wise person's own well-being. But if good all is right, the sort of well-being that the wise person is concerned with isn't just his or her own well-being, but almost inevitably it's the well-being of the larger community or the group that the wise person doesn't just understand, again, what's good for him or her, but uh, good for a larger group. And if good all's right, it isn't just the larger group, but it's the larger group seven generations ahead. Now, I'm not sure if good all's right about the seven generations ahead or about how far that goes, but I do think she's right that insofar as someone just cared about his or her own well-being at the expense of the group's well-being, to the extent that that's even possible, then I don't think we would regard that person as wise. So there's a kind of logic of wisdom, I think, that the wise person is concerned for well-being in a sense that radiates out, radiates out towards the community and towards the group, maybe even radiates out towards the future. And the note there on the bottom, that this is my take, this is the way I understand the claim that God alone is wise, the scriptural claim from Romans, is that if you think of the sort of community or group 
on the largest possible scale. So it's the well-being not just of humanity seven generations ahead, but the well-being, as it were, of the universe or of the cosmos. Then really the only person who could know, think what's good or important for that kind of well-being or could cultivate that well-being uh, would be God. So, in fact, we usually think of the relevant unit of well-being on a smaller scale, the kind of well-being of the community, the well-being of the group, maybe a couple generations ahead. But if you thought of it in an even larger way, then arguably only God would be wise. Most of us, again, in our everyday lives, we think of it in smaller ways. But I think Goodall is right, that it has to do with what some people have called so a concern for the well-being of the whole, a concern for something like the common good. I think that's characteristic of the wise person. So that was my uh, first condition. So again, remember the slogan was that the wise person is someone who knows how to live well. And I said there are three aspects of that. Knowledge of what's good or important for well-being. Knowledge of where you stand. So let's, let's just stick with those two for now. You might say, suppose you just satisfied that first condition, that you knew what was good or important for well-being, and especially the relative ranks of these things. Would such a person thereby count as wise? Uh, I think the answer is no. So I think that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. I think we need to add conditions. So the first example, a few examples to try to illustrate this. So suppose I think that, uh, and truly I know this, let's say, that having uh, a strong, supportive marriage is, is good for well-being. It's good for my well-being. It's good for my spouse's well-being. It's good for Rachel's well-being. But suppose, in fact, uh, I also think that I have this strong, respectful marriage. But in fact, my selfish behavior has been eroding my relationship for years. And we have kind of a shell of a marriage. Then, far from thinking of that person as wise, I think the person actually comes off as rather foolish. So if an example like that is right, you not only need to know what's good or important for well-being, but you have to have some sense of where you stand relative to what's good or important for well-being. So a more famous historical example of this is from uh, the example of the craftsman in Plato's Apology. So for those of you who have read the Apology, you know that um, so Socrates went around Athens trying to find people who were wise and trying to, to probe them about what they knew. So he would go to the politicians and ask the politicians about the nature of justice, go to the poets and ask them about beauty, the generals about courage, and all of them were terrible uh, at answering these questions. And then he came to the craftsmen, so the people who were actually the cobblers and the ship makers and the builders, and he admired the craftsmen because they actually had knowledge. They actually, unlike the generals who claim to know about, say, courage, or the politicians who claim to know about justice, the cobblers really knew about making shoes. They really knew this thing. You know, the builders really knew about making houses. But according to Socrates, one, the, the persistent failing of the craftsmen was that they didn't rest content with the knowledge they had. They also thought, they knew, let's say, that it was very important to have knowledge about things like Okay, this is getting meta for a second. They thought it was very important to have uh, knowledge of things like the true nature of justice, the true nature of beauty, the true nature of the good. And the craftsmen tried out their theories about, the, they, they believed their theories about the nature of justice, the nature of beauty, the nature of the good. But according to Socrates, at least, they were practically worse than the politicians and the poets and, uh, and the generals. Uh, they didn't have knowledge about these important things. They just had mere opinion, a mis misguided opinion. So one way to think about the craftsmen would be like this. They knew what was really important for well-being, having genuine knowledge of, of what was beautiful and what was good and what was just. But they mistakenly thought that they had this knowledge, whereas, in fact, they only had mere opinion. So as it were there, again, they come off looking foolish or less than wise because they didn't have an accurate sense of where they stood with respect to what really was important. So by my light, this is, again, a really important uh, feature of wisdom, and I think it helps to get at the, the Delphic idea. So, you know, um, so the, on the inscription above the, the Temple of Delphi was this Greek idea to know thyself. 
I think part of why knowing thyself is important for wisdom is getting a sense of just uh, where you are currently. So you might think that certain things are good or important, but unless you have a sense of where you are, you're not going to realize, you're not going to have a good uh, grasp of how to get where you need to be. So I, I think this is a, another necessary condition on wisdom. Now the third thing, so again we could say, I've, I've named two necessary conditions. Uh, is that sufficient? And I still think the answer is no, intuitively. So just if you think about it, if the wise person knows uh, what's good or important for well-being and knows where he or she stands well, relative to what's good or important, then, so think of where you are now as point A, think of where you want to get as point B. Surely the wise person has some clue, some sense about how to get from point A to point B. If really he or she thought that just, I think this is good or important, and I think I stand here, but I have no clue about how to get from A to B, I think uh, we wouldn't regard that person as wise. So they could be quite general strategies. So one of my favorite uh, quotes about wisdom comes from the Talmud, and the Talmud asks and answers the question. So the Talmud asks, uh, who is wise? And the answer is, uh, the one who learns from all people. Now that's a, not a, that's almost, that's a strategy for getting, stra that's a meta strategy as it were. That's, a, that's, a, that's an attempt to live your life in a way that you learn good techniques, good strategies for realizing what's good or important for well-being. And you might de be dedicated not just to thinking about learning from others, but indeed from learning from experience, to being open to new experiences. So I think unless the person has that in their toolkit, as it were, that we'd be reluctant to think of him or her as wise. Okay, so this is what I get for putting slides together with Brian Francis. <laughs> so, um, so let's use a, a test case. So I've, I've offered this theory so far, uh, these three necessary conditions, a knowledge of the world, and knowledge of where you stand. Uh, and knowledge of some effective strategies. So think of Socrates uh, as a test case for this idea. How well would he fare, a parad paradigmatic wise person? You know, again, it's going to depend on our particular views, but I think he fares pretty well. So does Socrates know what's good or important for well-being? Let's just suppose that acquiring things like knowledge of the true nature of, of beauty and goodness and justice that this is good or important for well-being, that he was right about that. And let's suppose, too, that he had knowledge of where he stood relative to what was good or important. So he realized that he was ignorant of these things, that he lacked them. And the third condition, knowledge of effective strategies, well, how did Socrates propose uh, gaining those things? Well, through the process of dialectic or debate or engaging with anyone he could find. So this was his strategy, this was his goal, this was a, an accurate sense, you might say, of where he stood relative to what was very important. So we'd have to actually commit to the idea that these things are good, but let's just, he seems at least to be a strong candidate uh, for wisdom. So that seems to be an asset of the theory. Okay, so, um, so I said a theory like that, uh, knowing how to live well, the wise person knows how to live well, it's a challenge to put meat on the bones of the theory, to articulate it. So I'll try to do that, lay out these three conditions. It's also a challenge to uh, uh, meet objections that other you know, um, thoughtful philosophers have come up with. So here's an objection uh, that maybe the leading writer on uh, wisdom these days, Sharon Ryan at uh, University of West Virginia, has proposed, so against the idea that knowledge would be a necessary condition. So Sharon Ryan writes, uh, since so much of what, is, what was considered knowledge has been abandoned or has evolved over time, a theory of wisdom that requires truth through a knowledge condition would exclude almost all people who are now long dead, including Hypatia, Socrates, Aristotle, Homer, Lao Tzu, etc., from the list of the wise. But that epistemic luck should not count against being wise. What matters as far as being wise goes is not that a wise person has knowledge, 
but that he or she, but that she has highly justified and rational beliefs about a wide variety of subjects, including knowing how to live well, uh, science, philosophy, mathematics, history, geography, art, literature, psychology, and so on. So think of the, the first part of that quote from Ryan to begin with. So the objection would be, if you required, if wisdom required knowledge, knowing how to live well, and, and since knowledge requires truth, uh, that's widely accepted among philosophers, you can't know that Lincoln was the 20th president. I really believe it, but you can't know it because it's not true. The knowledge requires truth. And according to Ryan, um, since knowledge requires truth, all those great thinkers, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Ptolemy, would be out of the ranks of being wise because their worldviews were so widely mistaken. So Ptolemy seemed like he was extremely wise, but his uh, view of the solar system was uh, extremely wrong, let's say. So uh, that would take him out of the ranks of being wise. Now, I think this is an interesting objection, and I've actually become more sympathetic to it uh, over time. But the quick thing I would say in response is that I'm not sure this would be an objection to the view as I've cast it here, because I'm not claiming that to be wise requires having, say, uh, having an accurate knowledge of physics or an accurate knowledge of chemistry or biology. What I'm claiming is necessary for wisdom is knowing how to live well. And arguably, the difference in time does not affect, say, how Confucius weighed uh, friendship relative to status, relative to duty, or did not affect that claim for Hypatia or Ptolemy. I think we could consider them wise in virtue of how they weighed these different uh, goods, you might say, in a way that uh, uh, has a truth element and is something that they could know. Okay, so that's a worry that, that's, a, that's an objection that um, these conditions as I've laid them out aren't, uh, weren't necessary. There's another objection that they're not uh, sufficient. So this is the point I raised earlier because it seems like surely I'm leaving something out if you just talk about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Surely wisdom has what you might call existential or a lived out element and that we have to somehow get at this existential element. Um, so I guess I think there are uh, two options we could say we could add here. We could just say to the account, here are three conditions on wisdom, these three different types of knowledge. And in addition, we just say number four, uh, the wise person has to, as it were, live out his or her knowledge. That's one way to go. Um, but I think a, a way that I find more appealing is by trying to, to clarify the nature of the knowledge that's at issue. So I think we have five slides left. So getting that this is a long one, a lot of text. <coughs> okay. So this is from uh, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard from his book, uh, The Sickness Unto Death in 1849. So I'll read it. At the beginning, I'll just note that Kierkegaard says uh, to understand and to understand, but just where Kierkegaard talks about understanding, just try to substitute knowledge. I'll clarify this in a second. But the quote is extremely interesting. So uh, I'll go through it slowly. He says, to understand and to understand. Are these then two different things? Certainly a person stands there and says the right thing and so has understood it. And then when he acts, he does the wrong thing and so shows he has not understood it. Ah, when one sees someone protesting complete understanding of how Christ went about in the form of a lowly servant, poor, despised, mocked, and as the scriptures say, spitted upon, when I see that same person taking so many pains to seek refuge in the place where in worldliness it's good to be, setting himself up as securely as possible, when I see him so anxiously awaiting, as if his life depended on it, every unfavorable breath of wind from left or from right or left, so blissful, so utterly blissful, so jubilant, yes, to round it off, so jubilant that he even emotionally thanks God for it, for being honored and respected by everyone, everywhere. Then I often said, I've often said to myself, 
Socrates, Socrates, how could it be possible for this person to have understood what he claims to have understood? So again, although he's speaking about um, understanding, I think we could speak in all those cases about knowledge. So how could someone, as it were, in one breath in church claim to know that the most important thing is to live a life of Christ-like life? Yes, and then to walk yes, out of church, so and, and then to live their life as if the only thing that mattered was status or reputation. Uh, so there, there seem to be what Kierkegaard is pointing out is two different senses of no. You could, you could know, in one sense, that the most important thing is to live a Christ-like life, and yet that knowledge wouldn't manifest itself in the way the person lives. So we could work with that idea as follows. So he talks about to understand and to understand, uh, to, and we could say to know and to know. Let's think about that. Let's think about um, knowledge that you don't just parrot, that you don't just speak, that you don't just assert, but knowledge that actually guides your life as uh, engaged knowledge. And what uh, Kierkegaard was talking about as the kind of knowledge that you might just parrot might just say when somebody asks you a question, but doesn't engage with your life as this disengaged knowledge. So if you think of that distinction, then we could say that um, the kind of knowledge, one thing, one option for this view would be the kind of knowledge that I was talking about when I was saying knowledge of what's good or important for well-being, knowledge of strategies, would be what you might call engaged knowledge, because that would build in to that knowledge the lived out or the existential dimension. It would be knowledge that's locked in. Another thing, so that would be one, distinguish these two kinds of knowledge and to say what I was really talking about was the engaged, locked in knowledge. And you wouldn't even need a fourth condition, a lived out condition, because it would be baked into the first three. Uh, another alternative, which I actually find even more compelling, would be to say that that kind of disengaged knowledge that Kierkegaard was talking about that we might not even want to think of that as knowledge at all. So if you knock that out of the picture, then you don't, as it were, have this kind of knowledge of what's good or important that could be fail to be lived out. Um, let me let me try to explain what I mean. So I find this uh, quote from Eric uh, Schwitzgable, who's a contemporary philosopher at the University of Riverside, California, uh, helpful. Schwitzgable says, if, it, if the aim of attributing belief is to say something about how we steer through the world, then judgment cannot be sufficient for belief. In other words, uh, what the person does in church when they mouth the words, they might just give a judgment, a mere, you know, mere assertion. But belief is actually the kind of thing which you don't just say, but which guides your life. It steers you through the world. And the kind of so-called knowledge that doesn't steer you through the world doesn't really have that element of belief to begin with. It just has something very superficial. And if you think that knowledge requires belief, then that would fall out as a kind of knowledge. So let me just reiterate. Three possibilities for getting at the existential dimension of wisdom. We could just add it on. We could say that there's this distinction between two kinds of knowledge, and it's the engaged kind. Or we could say, really, at this level, there's just uh, that that kind of disengaged knowledge isn't really knowledge at all, because you don't even really believe it. Belief is the kind of thing that guides you on. I actually favor the third option, but I'm kind of open to thinking it through. OK, so I think three more slides up. So I've given this theory, and I think it's worth noting now. Um, so of course, it's hard to become wise. We know that. So what can we say along those dimensions? Well, as I've described it, if, if in fact wisdom has this locked in or existential dimension, if it has a lived out dimension, then acquiring that kind of knowledge is in fact not so easy. So let's say in order to really know these things about Christianity, know that it's um, that the best thing is to li live a life in imitation of Christ. The reason why that's not easy is because if knowledge requires this strong element of belief, and belief is going to be the kind of thing that guides you through life, well, you have to have all the right 
uh, dispositions and loves and wills, you have to be a lot more engaged than just assenting to a proposition. Your passions have to be behind this knowledge. They have to be swimming with the beliefs. Uh, and that's not easy to do. It's very easy to come out and say something like, I take the most important thing to be X. But when X is hard to do, it's hard to get all of your passions and everything else swimming in that direction. So not easy to become wise. The second uh, way it's, it's hard to become wise is, of course, just the complexity of particular cases. You might have a rough sense of what's good or important for well-being, but then when it comes down to the crunch and you're trying to decide between being just and being merciful, being just and being kind, of course, individual cases are going to be extremely hard. So their uh, experience will be necessary in many cases. And let me just say, so with respect to the content of, of Christian wisdom in particular, um, it's just going to be hard to be wise in a Christian sense. So in the first letter of the Corinthians, um, St. Paul says, uh, talks about, uh, you know, I preach Christ crucified, which is um, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. It's, it's foolishness. It's not wisdom to the Gentiles because think about the kind of life that Christianity says is the best life. It's a life where you could be despised, where you could be crucified, where you could be hung up on a cross and, and just... Uh, you know, spit upon, where you could be uh, just turned aside by the world. So to think that in any way this is commonsensical, that this is a good kind of life, that this is the best life, uh, it's in no way commonsensical. Uh, so becoming, so thinking, so adopting that kind of attitude is especially hard, I think. And uh, just two more slides. So what do we say then about... Um, the hard cases from earlier, so the case of uh, Machiavelli or the devil, uh, I think one thing we could say now is that, so I, I think since, um, since trying to obtain what's good or important for well-being and especially for the community is such a crucial aspect of wisdom, anybody who's wise is going to be, as it were, um, a student of psychology you are going to understand what makes people tick, what they care about, what they fear. What, if you're going to try to achieve the common good and get people striving towards a common end, then that's going to be almost non-negotiable, that you're this shrewd judge of character in a way that it's clearly negotiable that well, you're like good at mechanics or good at the stock market or uh, you know, a good gardener. But to be wise with respect to human psychology, to be wise in that domain, is going to be crucial for bringing about wisdom in this, in this broader sense. And I think that's what someone like um, anyone who's a shrewd judge of psychology, so Machiavelli or the devil, I mean, we have a phrase for this, right? These people are wise in the ways of men or something like They understand human vanities. They understand what, what would inspire people to do certain things and turn away from others. So I think the reason why we're confused, why we're tempted to say that people like Machiavelli are wise and not just wise with respect to a domain is because the kind of wisdom that they have is so crucial to what I'm calling overall wisdom. And the final thought is, um, so I've said, I said at the outset, it's that puzzling that, um, that philosophers don't talk a lot about wisdom these days. For the last, really, since I, I, I'm going to overgeneralize, let's just say since the Middle Ages, it just has not been the central concept on the map for philosophers. And if I'm right, I think the theory that I've offered here helps to explain why it hasn't been the central feature on the map. Because when you're making judgments about wisdom, you're making judgments that are steeped in ethical and maybe even metaphysical claims. That, as a word, there is better and worse ways of living. There are things that are more important or less important for well-being. But those are all substantial ethical and maybe metaphysical commitments. 
And if you get off the chain with respect to thinking some kind of objectivity with respect to what's more or less important for well-being, I suggest you're going to have less time for the notion of wisdom as well, even for that concept of wisdom. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.